<laughs> Hello, we are live on Genealogy Quick Start. Do you know the country genealogists? Well, during my very first road trip, I heard about him. <clears throat> the country genealogist was a person that was so special that the state archives told us about him. He said, you know, he is between us and your research county where you're going to, so you might wanna go see him. So I was wondering what was so special about this man that the state archives told me to visit him. Well, <clears throat> my friend Diane and I said, there was no way that we were gonna miss this opportunity to visit him. <clears throat> and he had this, we pulled up, <clears throat> we heard he had this big double wide trailer full of stuff. And he loved genealogy so much that he does other people's research. He spends time just getting records and pulling out African-American genealogy anytime he sees someone in there. And you know what? This man is so special that when the county is throwing out books, yes, the county throws away books. When they get rid of books, which they're legally allowed to do, the country genie, they call him and he backs up his little pickup truck and carries those books away and he indexes them and pulls out all the black people and anything interesting. So why am I telling you all about this man? Well, this man said <clears throat> the most underutilized but most useful record that there is out there is probably court records. He said court records is it. And that is one of our focuses today, court records in the case of the hog's head. And then we're going to have a special guest from like, I really want to be buried here. We'll talk about that on the second half of the show. The Library of Congress, one of my favorite places. I cannot wait till we can get back out. Algae. My friend Ahmed will share a fascinating story about an enslaved man and how he was able to uncover his past using the records of the Library of Congress. But before we get to that, first, let's talk about the case of the hog's head. So first up, <clears throat> excuse me, before I tell you about that, I wanted to say welcome to Genealogy Quick Start, which is viewable, Facebook, YouTube, and Philly Cam. Thank you followers, subscribers, and likers, and Philly Cam. So let me let you know that I am so appreciative of all of you, no matter where you are. So again, welcome. So without further ado, now for the case of the hog's head. So I want to ask you first, before I bring Jim and them on, what do you think about when you think of hog's head? You know, what do you think about? I think of hog's head cheese. Yes, I do. Did your family, you know, fight over hog's heads? I don't know. I'm, I'm really concerned about what we're about to learn here. But maybe I'm just thinking about cheesy. And when I think about cheesy, I think about my buddy, Jim Beidler. How are you, Jim? Columnist. <laughs> Where did that come from? I, I had could, to tie it in. You're not cheesy alone. Michael John Neal, cheesy as well. Oh, Hello to all of my cheesy buddies. I, I just you? I just don't know what to say about <laughs> I'll tell you I know what this to is say. not about Wisconsin. It's not got, that kind of cheese. It's I not got, cheese, as a matter of fact at all. I um, got your cheesy right here. <laughs> <laughs> So guys, this country genealogist said, you know, court records are so important. So why do you concur and why are court records so important? Well, I would concur for a variety of reasons. One, oftentimes you can determine relationships in court records, not all the time, but sometimes, especially if they're fighting over an inheritance, you, it delineates a lot of relationships in those in those records when we're getting at what property rights different people had. In, in other cases, just looking at the, the depositions, the affidavits, and the testimony, if, if those materials are still extant, that can give you a tremendous amount of social history, teach you some historical things that, that we're going to see in this presentation a little bit. And if nothing else, it gets you searching. For, we're not even going to discuss the case of the Yellow Waters today. Uh, we'll, we'll cut that one out. Um, <laughs> okay. 
that's, that's, no, no, there was a court case in Virginia and it, the horse died of the yellow waters and that was a disease. It's not the kind of disease you might think it was. But when we look at these records, there are so, you know, besides the relationships, there's social history. You can learn a little bit, a little bit more about your ancestors, lifestyle, maybe occupation. And, and those are always good things for us to, uh, to find out. And these are, these are happenings in their lives uh, that don't fit into the, you know, if you want, want to say the uh, prototypical uh, chronology of birth, baptism, confirmation, marriage, you know, by land, uh, marry again, maybe, uh, death, burial. You know, these are things that, uh, that will add information uh, about their lives, you know, were they litigious? Were they were they be, being sued all the time by somebody else? So, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes the testimony will have, you know, it's like today when the judge says, shut up, I don't need to hear that. There will be testimony in <laughs> it, sometimes that has nothing to do with the case, but from a genealogy standpoint is extremely uh, interesting and important. Exactly. Yep. All right. So let's, without further ado, Let's go ahead and get started with our first kicks quick start, which is the case of the hog's head. So step one for the case of the hog's head is determine the court of jurisdiction. So what does that mean and how do you do that? Well, court records are the ones we're talking about. They're local county, usually county records. And so to find those, you'll need to know where your ancestor was living. Um, because that's where the, that county court is where those, re the local records that we're talking about will be, will be located or where they were originally created. Um, you sometimes want to broaden your circle out just a little bit, particularly if you had someone who lived near the county line, as some of us do, they might've been sued in an adjacent county, perhaps for one reason or another. So you, with all records, you want to kind of broaden that circle out, but with court records, it's important because you, you don't know, they might've done something across the county line that that resulted in court action so how you do you know where, you know where they live. how do you know when it's uh like a county versus like the town is it usually if it's an urban area it would be more so a county usually at the town? T town, town records at the town level it's usually a new england thing for the most part there are and virginia has independent cities as well that maintain their own so if it's the independent city, you'll be looking in those as opposed to the county. Right. And, and, and it, it all goes back to without having that whole discussion, you've got to understand the, the political lines and all that in the area where your person lives. So it goes back to those maps that we're not going to discuss today. But it, it does go back to that. And, and, you, and you do have to realize that the the count what we're calling county courts may come under all sorts of names, chancery courts, oyer and terminer quarter sessions, orphans court. And, you know, a lot of these had specific original uh, uh, definitions. A lot of them came came out of English law. Uh, and, you know, it, it may it may vary from uh, from one to one count, one state to the other, usually. OK, so once you get your determined jurisdiction, then you want to move on to step two, of course, which is to locate the court case. And so how do you do that? Are the are they available online? Where it, are you going to find it's these cases? The, online is the first place to look. I would look at the family search catalog to see if they happen to have these records online. I would look to see if uh, state archives, the, the example we're going to look at today comes from uh, digital images at the Library of Virginia. Uh, but uh, the library, Virginia, li great site. Just pause and say love to the library of Virginia because they are just so special, aren't they? Right. And the, the, the thing to remember is even if they're online at family search, uh, they might not when family search microfilmed and that's where a lot of the digital images of court records on family search come from, or the microfilm images they did years ago, they might not have microfilmed everything. What, what we're looking at today comes from the, the court packet of, of loose papers. And that's what you real to get the really, really good stuff. That's what you want to get. And you may find some bits about the court case on family search, but then you're probably going to want to communicate with the, with those local offices to see if, the, if they do still have those court packets of papers that are still extant. So um, let's talk about this first, this case we have here. Talk to us. Well, 
one thing before we get into the court. Oh, sure, sure. When, I'm still when you're, excited. Go ahead. When you're looking at, at defendants' indexes and plaintiffs' indexes, you want to look at your immediate family members and broaden that circle out. Okay, uh, for, wait a for minute. the whole so extended these, family. Okay, we have these different indexes. So you said there's a defendant's index. And typically, a right. Typically, there's a uh, there's a plaintiff's index. That's the person who's complaining. <laughs> if, you, if you need something to help you remember that word, they're bringing the case to, to court. And there'll usually be an index for the plaintiff. Usually the, the main plaintiff will be in the plaintiff's index. And the defendant's index is the person who is having to defend themselves uh, or the person that was being, being sued. And so you'll want to look in both those indexes for all me your, relative, your immediate family and kind of the broader family because someone might have tested, we'll see here in this example, they might have testified in a case where they weren't even really sued, but their testimony could still be really, really informative. Yes, testimony is always informative. So can I show the record now? You can show the record because okay. we're going to, I know you're excited about it. I'm excited um, about the record. So this is what you've got here. This was a uh, 1790 era case in Amherst County, Virginia. And this is one uh, part of one deposition. Um, I think we got a transcription of it coming later. But what happened was this gentleman was using a hogshead of tobacco, which is a large way tobacco was shipped on the river down, in this case, to Richmond to be sold or what have you. And he borrowed money and he assigned his interest in a hogshead of tobacco. That's how he was going to pay the debt, was with a hogshead of tobacco in a large, uh, large container of it after it had been dried. And when they got the, the down to the river, they got it in this hogshead to to ship it the hog's head fell into the river um and part of the tobacco was damaged and my aunt, it had to be replaced and the guy my ancestor was irritated because at that point in time i think the guy he owed money to had responsibility for it but he damaged it in transit and wanted my ancestor to make up the difference. And so my ancestor didn't want to do that. He said, I brought that much tobacco for you to ship. You screwed it up. That's not on me. That That's the essence of what was going on there. And the, 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 um, the deposition that we saw a moment ago was from a, a, a man. I think it was, I forget which one it was. It was one of John Sled's sons that is giving a deposition. And the really nice thing about this is he says, my name is, I think it was William. William Sled, I am a son of John. Oh, this is John Sled Jr. that did this one. But he says right in the text of it, I am this, I'm John Sled Sr.'s son. And then he talks about how much the hog's head weighed. I think it weighed about 1,450 or 60 pounds, if I'm remembering the number correctly. So this was quite, quite a heavy object. And so they would load these up down at the river. Um, you just can't back it up a semi and take it on the interstate. You're going to have to, you know. Um, and so that, that that's the hog set. It had nothing to do with hogs. That was just a, that was just to get like a magician. It was to get you distracted from what was really going on. Um, and it, it served its purpose. But there's the deposition from John Jr. We're going to see a couple other things as we go through the, the case here in a little bit. Okay. So when you locate, Jim, do you have any additional thoughts on like locating cases? We basically covered it. Uh, just, just that there, there are some times when it's only going to be those indexes has sur that have survived. And mm -hmm. I mean, Michael's absolutely correct that the loose papers are the, the gold, mm -hmm. you know, that you're, that you're looking for. But, uh, and I'll just, do a quick interjection that I have a case where all I have is the index entry. And thankfully in a probate file, there was reference to the family discord because what the court case was, was a, a, a daughter-in-law uh, suing her father-in-law uh, and saying that he had hid silverware from her and all, all sorts of stuff. Wow. If, if from the court side, uh, you know, all I have is that, you know, one versus the other uh, notation. But if, thankfully, there's a probate petition that, you know, kind of sort of relates to it all. So, yeah. Right. So, you're and, right. You never know what's going to actually survive. No, so I want to I want to correct a problem a sometimes. Yes, it's a huge problem. I want to correct a mistake I made. I did not 
properly announce our guests today, our people here today. So I want to say hi to Judy um, Middle, who's here. Wayne Magnolia, you're here. Hello, Dean Henry, Michelle in Omaha, Nebraska. Avis Ward from Oakland. Nice to see you. Angela Allen from Houston. So she says, Angela says, Hoghead cheese and crackers. I'm digging it, Angela. <laughs> see, we on the same wavelength here. <laughs> Ellos Proctor, LOC website is so hard to navigate. Barb, I might have to do this again because I love the LOC website. Uh, Je and, and Ahmed is going to have some tips for you too. Jenny, hello. Something dealing with hogs, Jenny said. Um, A Ward, fighting to eat it. Family members are still eating it. You don't have to fight. Just give it to me, A W A Ward. Guess who's on here? Dr. Debbie has got on from Cleveland. Welcome, Dr. Debbie. And Joe, interim president of uh, Cleveland group out there. Welcome, welcome. And Terry and Juanita and Ellen. Hello from Central Washington State. All right. So that was step two which is to locate the case. So you got family search you want to check out. Family search is so deep when it comes to things like that. So we're moving on to step three, which is to transcribe and look up unusual terms. So before Michael gets and starts wowing you with these terms, I want to show you two books that I have on my shelf. I might've shown you these before. A to Zach for genealogists. Anything that says for genealogists, just check it out. And then there's, what did they mean by that? This is another one that I enjoy on my bookshelf. And so talk to us about transcribing and looking up unusual terms. I would add one thing before you transcribe to help you understand the, the whole case. If you've got that packet of papers, I would put them in the in the chronological order in which they took place that will won't guarantee you'll understand everything but that will help you get a broad overview and, and you just understand the flow a little better and things will make somewhat more sense if you do that um Great. transcription you know it's if, if the handwriting is not good and the examples we've got here the handwriting is not bad if you think it's bad yeah, that's it's pretty good. a lot worse <laughs> um I've got cases from Kentucky where it's it's awful. This this so this is a transcription. I would suggest to people um, turn off. You might even want to turn off your spell check if you're using something that has spell check. I leave blanks the first time I go through it. I try to do it quickly. Leave blanks where I can't figure something out because if I do it as quickly as I can, that helps me keep the flow. And sometimes if you kind of got the flow, it helps you to understand things. Um, but this is a transcription of the first, uh, the document that we saw a moment ago. Once I transcribe things, I use the transcriptions. That's just easier. And you, you really got to transcribe it. Don't keep, right. tra if you don't do it the first time, you end up transcribing it every single time you need information out of it. Right. So just take the time, save yeah. yourself time. And the like other, you said, just do it quick. You don't have to be perfect. You can come back and do it again, right? <laughs> right. And, and the other thing is when you transcribe it, you notice things that you don't notice when you eyeball it really quickly. When you look, when you're reading those details, you notice yeah. things you don't notice before. Um, but this, it, it talks about, uh, they weighed it, just how much it was, talks about going down to the river. Um and they had to get 300, I think 300 more pounds of tobacco to make up um, when they repriced it. And we'll talk about what that, what prizing and reprising means. Um, my, for those of you that may be unfamiliar with that term, as I was when I first read that. Um, and here's another, I think this is a different, that, that mentions the prizing it. The prizing it, it doesn't mean they took it to the Amherst County Fair and it got a prize. <laughs> that's, that, that's not what it means. Um, it's, it's that whole process and I had to do a Google search and you, I had to get beyond just the first page of hits that came up when I did the searches for this. And in some of this old terminology, I, I don't go to Google directly. I'll go to Google or books.google.com, those transcriptions of old books, because I'm looking for old terminology here from the 1790s or whatever. I don't maybe want modern, modern things. I want old stuff. Prizing to, to really simplify it as part of that process of drying it and packing it to put it in that large uh, container that hold held 1,400 pounds of it. That's prizing. 
Um, and when he mentioned reprising, they some of it got wet, so they had to take it all out or take a lot of it out and reprise it, put it back in there. The Stillers. Yeah, when, so it's like prize. They said like prize, like prizer, a prize, mm -hmm. appraisal. Right. It's That's probably what, what right. It's probably it. right. It, but it's not quite appraising it. It's it's the process of of drying it and packing it in that in that hogshead, um, in that container. And the Stillers are what were used to weigh it. Okay. Um, because okay. they want to know what the weight, the weight of that was. Um, but don't, you know, don't assume you know what a word means. It, it, well, oh, that's prize, P-R-I-Z-E. I, I can read that. I, I don't know what it means, but I can read that. You want to look up those words, even if you think you know what they mean. Even you know, if uh, you think we all know everything. If you, especially right? if all, you think you know what they mean, to be honest. We're all with you, right? infectious disease specialists now. So, you know, we're going to know these words, right? <laughs> Something There's like another um, where you had another word you wanted to highlight. This, that right. This was another. Uh, this guy was testifying about who owed the debt and to whom it was owed. And he, the dude that originally loaned the money to my ancestor for which the hog's head was the collateral, he left Virginia after this little incident and could not be heard from. But before he left, he assigned the debt to this um, George Lambert. And George Lambert is his agent and factor. And when I think of factor, I, you know, I taught math for a long time. I think of factors of a number or things yes. that are important. And factor is a, it's a no longer used legal term, not quite like an agent, but it's for our purposes, it's similar to an agent. Um, and so that's what that word means. He could act in his stead and do certain, uh, perform certain legal things. And that was easy to read, but that was another one that when I, on the surface, factor, what's fact, what is it? You know, you, you got to look it up. Um, and so there was a question that I missed. It says, uh, Wayne asked, what if a town was part of one county, then became a part of another county? Would, would the records have stayed with the old county? Generally, they stay with the old county, but 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 it doesn't hurt to check both places because, uh, you know, I've seen that they they that the new county might have records to ones created in the old county. They might have uh, like a index to the records right. created in the old county something like that yep so wayne to our to like a at home per you know camden county was gloucester county and so when i'm doing lawn side research pre-1844 i believe i go to the gloucester county uh, library as opposed to going to the camden county library so yeah and but you want to check everywhere yep. like jim said um okay perfect um so that is step three. Anything else on transcribing and looking up in unusual terms? No, I not really. I just reiterate, take your transcribe relatively quickly, leave blanks first, the things you can't figure out, and go back and look those up. And yeah. I want to give a shout out to Mary Bell who taught me how to transcribe. Thank you, Mary Bell. <laughs> All right, on to step four which is research non-litigants. So what does that mean? Well, in this case, there were, uh, there, there were, you know, there was the, my ancestor and the guy that he owed the money to, they were the main litigants that were involved in this case. But individuals that give testimony, individuals that give depositions, like the one we saw earlier, Isaac Wright. Um, and so what I did here in this case, I just pulled, these were the main individuals that gave some testimony. Um, the sleds, they were dep deponents. They refer to themselves as his sons and then the date of the deposition. Um, Jesse Tucker's another dude mentioned. He took the, the tobacco, as it says, from Salt Creek to Davy Ferry. Um, so he obviously was an associate of my ancestor. The same thing as Isaac Wright. And then the bond, that, that, that was the note for, uh, the, for which the tobacco was the collateral, basically. Uh, it was John Sled and this man named John Sale are both signing. The Sale was not a part of the court action, but he did sign that bond um, that my ancestor signed. So those are individual. The, the two first guys are obviously ones I want to look up a little bit. But the others were individuals that knew my ancestor. Looking up at them a little bit could give me some clues or ideas that I don't already yeah. already have. They're, they're members of the fan club. The, exactly. The fan family. club. And Friends, we have the queen of the cluster. We have the queen of the cluster on here, Dr. Debbie. So she definitely will say, woo, woo. Y'all talking to her language here. Research the non-litigants. Oh, are you guys kind of making a new acronym since you didn't say fan non-litigants? All right. 
<laughs> Michael's well, we're talking cases. about court cases in, in particular. So yes, yes. For court yeah, cases, yeah. we have the RNLs. Research the RNLs, guys. All right. So on to step five, which is to gather additional records. You guys are like, yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, ba yeah, but basically it would be follow up on those leads that are suggested in the, in the case and those names, those names of those other individuals that we talked about, see if the, if the court case suggests other records specifically it, in terms of this, of this case with the tobacco and the hog's head, I would do a little bit of research into just tobacco production, how it was transported in, in the late, um, 18th century, that whole process. There was a page on, I think it was the North Carolina State Archives, where I found a great page. It talked about prizing. It talked about the whole process of, of tobacco production and sale, roughly in the time period that I was interested in, which gave me a much broader understanding. You know, you think as soon as I thought about it for a minute, well, yeah, 1,400 pounds of tobacco, they're going to have to how they get that to Richmond is not then is not like it would be today. It's a different, a different process. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I go ahead, want, Jim, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and you want to look at these, the, these, uh, these RNLs uh, <laughs> and, you know, find <laughs> records about them uh, because by adding to their biographies, you might find something more about their relationship to your ancestors. And your right. ancestor might have been an RNL. Right. Them. The other thing is it goes both ways. These are individuals that testified for your ancestors. You might want to see if they were sued to see if your ancestor testified, um, you know, and, and whether it's helpful or not, you don't know. If you don't know when your dude died, but he, but you look up one of these RNLs in a court case 20 years later, and there your ancestor is giving testimony, then boom, you've extended his lifetime. Non-medically, you've extended his <laughs> lifetime by 20 years because you, you know, we're being a little facetious there about that, but you found him testifying in a court case. If you didn't know when he died, that, you know, that, that, that could be helpful. Some oftentimes whether things are helpful depend upon how little, you know, and how confused you are. <laughs> I mean, seriously, seriously. You know, I mean, sometimes clues aren't helpful, but in other cases, those little statements can be a really significant Huge. clue. Just, they can be depend. very significant. So let's and, look at our quick start for the case of the hog's head or researching court's records. Step one is to determine the court of jurisdiction. Step two is to locate the court case. Step three, transcribe and look up unusual terms. Please transcribe, please transcribe. You'll feel so good when you go back. You'll feel so professional. Step four, research non-litigants or RNLs. And step five, gather additional records. So guys, thank you so much for a fun, quick start. And we'll see you again soon. Sounds good. All right, so now it is time for our second quick start. Give me one second. All right, welcome to our second quick start with a buddy of mine. Let's see, where did I meet Ahmed? I met Ahmed at IGHR where I think I meet everyone. And since then, you know, they, open their arms to us as a genealogy group and, you know, said, come on up. It was just like, we felt like the Library of Congress was our personal space. I don't think that the people in Philly were happy that I forced them to get up and meet at like five in the morning. But when they saw Ahmed, they was like, woo, yeah, I'm all right with getting up in the morning. I'm going to see this brother. You liven them ladies up, Ahmed. You and Reggie, I thank you so much for, mm -hmm. you know, being so welcoming. Um, it, it was just like a great time to come to D.C. When we came to the, to the Library of Congress, we'd hang out with you and Reggie Downs. When yeah. we went to the National Archives, we'd hang out with Reggie Washington, of course. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you guys for just being so welcome, holding it down in D.C. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me too. Thanks for having me. 
Yes, yes, yes. And so un, um, unfortunate, we don't, thanks for letting me know that our friend Reggie is, uh, Reggie Downs um, is no longer with us, but Reggie, always thankful to you, buddy. Rest um, in peace, rest in peace. So let's get going with our quick start. Um, you came up with this really, really good, like amazing um, quick start dealing with an African-American case study. Mm -hmm. So first tell me like, how did this all like get started without telling me the whole story? Why, how did this all get started? Well, actually just uh, playing around on our website uh, one day and I just began searching our slave narratives. And I went to Hampton University, which is the real HU. <laughs> uh, so I did a search for Virginia. So I wanted to do some searching of uh, slave narratives from Virginia. Okay, so let's take, I think you, we stepping into the story. So let's first talk about this quick start is called Locating the Past at the LOC. Mm -hmm. And that's the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. And so step one was really just to choose a person. Yeah. And you chose this person because? Because uh, I went to Hampton University and he lived in Hampton University after emancipation. Or it gets a little confusing, but uh, he ended up living in Hampton later in his later life. And he okay. mentioned my school, Hampton Institute, in the narrative. In the okay. So. I'm going to bring that up for you, show you the narrative here. And so these slave narratives, if you probably just Google Library of Congress, yeah. born yeah. in slavery, slave narrative, it should bring you to this page. Yeah. And we have them, uh, the, this is the digital portion. Uh, we also have them on microfilm. And we don't, we also have some published. So we have them in various formats. The slave okay. Format. So right now, all we can deal with is like the online version. Yeah, exactly. So in here, you f this is what you found was this narrative. And tell us about Richard Slaughter. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this was his narrative from 1936. And it was in Hampton, Virginia, dated December 27th. And let's just imagine uh, Mr. Slaughter was your relative. Uh, in the beginning of the narrative, he gives us such great, uh, genealogical information. First of all, he tells us when he was born. Uh, he tells us where he was born. He also tells us the name of his slave owner, which was a Dr. Richard Epps. Okay, then, let's pause right there. I mean, so many people Mm -hmm. This is what they're looking for. Exactly. It's stuff like this. And so he tells us Richard Epps is his, who was the person who enslaved and, him. And that's critical for making that transition from uh, emancipation back to enslavement, knowing the name of the slave owner. So that's really critical when you're doing uh, African-American uh, genealogical research, if you have slave ancestry. So that and so what, what else was in, did you find interesting in this slave narrative? Well, I found so much. Uh, I could go on and on, but I know <laughs> I, have, I have limited time. I know my time is limited. Uh, another interesting thing is he met Abraham Lincoln, Mr. Slaughter, during his time uh, uh, during the Civil War. Okay. They, gave, they gave Abraham Lincoln a ride to Mount Vernon. And the person interviewing Mr. Slaughter asked, what did he think of the president? And his response was, he looked like any other preacher to me. <laughs> so, and, 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 and that's why these are so, uh, these kinds of records are so dynamic because genealogy is about more than just, you know, names and dates. We want to know, you know, how people lived, what was their, uh, some of their struggles, some of their triumphs, what were their personalities like? And you can't usually find that for an enslaved person. So finding a slave narrative for your ancestor can lead to so much more. And I'm gonna continue to talk about it. Yeah, I, um, I, that you, you made such a great point. I mean, 
we are more than just our dates. That's right. And, you know, him saying he looked like any other preacher says he looked dignified. To me, he's saying right. he looked like a dignified man. That's right. And um, that spoke to who he was as a person, you know? He respected. He definitely respected him. him. Respected. And so, of course, he, he did join the, uh, the Union Army. Don't tell us that yet. <laughs> no, but I just want to say one other thing about the slave narratives before we move on sure. is that, you know, we all want to find our people, right? We want to put in our name and pop up and he says I was born and this was my slave owner. The it. other thing that's really good that I enjoy about the slave narratives is getting an understanding of what maybe that it was like in that county during that time period. So okay. I encourage people to not only look for their ancestors or their surnames, to also look up their counties or their yeah. towns because and see if anyone did a did a uh, an interview. Because and, they, may have, they may have had a shared connection, right? Yes. You may yes. find out something about your relative through their story, right? Of exactly, course. exactly. Of course. Of course. So let's move on to right. step two. <laughs> which is to research um, online records. So in addition to once you get that slave narrative, like they say, right, one yeah. record leads to many records. That's right. Is that what happened here for you? Yes, it led to several records, actually. Uh, I did some searching of our subscription databases, right? And here's an example. This is a screenshot of our uh, subscription databases. Now, I should mention that you do have to be at the Library of Congress to use these. Uh, these are databases that we pay for. And it's really small, but the second listing there is uh, ProQuest Historical Black Newspapers. Mm -hmm. and I love I, ProQuest. Right, we love ProQuest. So <laughs> I know that right across the, oh, can you go back for a second? Oh, sorry. Go back for one second. So if you see like that fifth one down, it says the Norfolk Journal and Guide. I know that Norfolk is right across the water from Hampton. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we had that particular newspaper, I wanted to do a search for my guy, Mr. Slaughter. So let's see what I found. <laughs> so this is it. I found an obituary and Genealogists, we love obituaries. Right? Woo love those obituaries. <laughs> Who loves those obituaries? <laughs> we love them because they, they provide so much information. And as you can see from this obituary, I was able to get uh, more information about Mr. Slaughter. Uh, first thing is we know that he died at age 89, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then we once again, we see that he served in, in the, the Union Army, Army. Mm -hmm. and he also was a member of the Queen Street Baptist Church. Ah, we can through those records as well, we can find more information from the church records. Also, we know that he died at his home, which was located on I didn't get the full address, but it's Mallory Street. Okay, I know where, I know where Mallory Street is because oh I went, my gosh, went to really? University. So all of these things are clicking in my mind. I'm like, I know what that is. Yes. We yes. brought a home there. And, uh, and further down in the obituary, he talks about, he gives the name of his wife. At the bottom, he says. Lucy. Right. His obituary provides the name of his wife. And it says they were married for 69 years. Also, once again, we see Dr. Epps. And we were able to go back a generation beyond Mr. Slaughter because it gives the names of his parents. Wow. And now I was able to go back a generation because it's wow. Mr. and Mrs. Stuart Slaughter. And we see that James River is now called Hopewell. And your previous guest mentioned how names change. Yes. So we have another clue. We know that uh, the City Point is now called Hopewell. So okay. with that information, we can do some more searching online. Oh my gosh, it just points one record just sends you out to so many different records. Follow the breadcrumbs. <laughs> Follow the breadcrumbs. 
So you ready to move on to step three? Yes. Step three is to use the clues to search for additional records. Like we said, every record leads to many records. Yes. And so we mm -hmm. knew from that obituary about him being a U.S. in the uh, Union Army. And so mm -hmm. you found this. This is his record from the U.S. Colored Troops. And I was unable to find a picture. And this gives a description of Mr. Slaughter. It gives his size as five foot three. Uh, he enlisted in the, uh, the Union at the age of 18 and his hair was black, his eyes were black and his occupation was a seller. So uh, these records were found uh, on Ancestry. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So it said he was a sailor. I wonder if he also was in, a, you know, he went to the Navy too. I'm not sure. Wow, this is some great stuff on him. Yes. Great stuff on him. All of this additional information, all of this came from one record, right? Following that one slave narrative and I was able to continue my search. And just keep moving and moving. I love that. I love that. So that is uh, step three to yeah. use those clues we knew from the obituary. And so then let's take a look at um, step four, which is to search Library Congress online for records. So, and this is a record. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. You can go ahead. No, just go. No, you talk. Oh, okay. I, so from there, I wanted to get, I wanted to locate images. You know, I wanted to find some pictures. Uh, if I couldn't find Mr. Slaughter, I wanted to find uh, other pictures, which may provide that, uh, like I said, that more information about his life, you know, where he was born, you know, maybe the, where he lived. So you can go to the next, uh, image we had. Oh, and <laughs> I thought it was going to be a picture, but it's not. <laughs> okay. So from there, I went to our online catalog. So let's scratch the pictures. So I wanted to find out more about uh, Richard Slaughter during his time in slavery, right? So I went to the records of the antebellum Southern plantations. These are records of uh, plantation owners. It's a huge collection. It's about huge. It's about fifteen hundred reels of microfilm, uh, and this is the best way to get started. Uh, looking at this index, uh, and this index, you're able to find uh, information by the name of the plantation, uh, the location of the plantation, or the plantation's owner. And then on the left there, you see some uh, guides. Uh, this provides information on what's what's uh, within the uh, particular collection. So of and course, have, and uh, of course, I have a book. Oh, you have it. Oh, yep, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Genealogical index. You can buy it. Yes. It's nice to have it home. Me and Cooper, it I has have the same book. I have a different edition though. Okay, it's probably it might be it might be an older one or a yeah, newer one, but it's so. it's really nice. It shows um it shows it by um location. Mm -hmm. Plantation owner. And then it'll show by let's see, I always get this by location, and then it shows it by name, by surname. Mm -hmm. It'll have a list since Angela Allen is on here. We'll show the A's and it'll show the information. And so this is great stuff. So what did you find in this collection? Well, I, I just located uh, more information about uh, Dr. Epps. I, I, genealogy never stops. So my research, <laughs> it continues. I didn't actually locate Mr. Slaughter yet, but I was able to find something interesting in the real list. Uh, and it talks about how uh, this particular uh, location, uh, Dr. Epps' home, became a hub for the Union soldiers. So how wow. ironic is that? You, wow. know, you go from a huge plantation with 
all of these uh, enslaved people. And then you become the hub for overtaking the uh, Confederate army. So I just think that's really ironic. And I always mention that when I talk about uh, where Mr. Slaughter was born. So are these records um, online primarily or are they also? Um... They've been microfilmed. Okay. And we do have a newer uh, database. It's called ProQuest uh, History Vault. Mm -hmm. And it's the index to these records. It's really cumbersome though. It's okay. really difficult. I mean, check it out, but I can't promise what you're going to get because I've used it and it's, it's just coming. okay. 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 <laughs> so use the microfilm. I prefer the microfilm. Okay. And so here's another, another you, you started talking about the picture and I'm sorry that I'm moving right. to the end, but. So, so, so yeah, this is a picture of uh, Dr. Epps. Uh, this was the owner of Richard Slaughter. And I was able to find this in the Virginia Historical Society. Uh, so it's just another uh, record that I found uh, at the Library of Congress using our uh, subscription databases. Uh, once again, this is something that you would have to actually be at the Library of Congress to use unless your local library has it. But uh, so can I ask you, like, have they said anything? Are you still kind of like, you know, just to be at home kind of phase? Or did they say you have a date to go back, people to come back in? Nothing. Uh, no date yet. OK, that's above my uh, pay, <laughs> pay grade. I don't I don't get into that. But no, no, no date yet. No date. OK, OK. So I love this picture. He looks like a man of leisure here, <laughs> yeah. chilling. Yeah. And so that's step four. Mm -hmm. um, let me just go back to um, step four. And did we have a I think we have a step five. Mm -hmm. And step five yeah. is to search for additional records. So yeah, that's the just, Library of Congress and then additional records. And here, what did you do for that? Oh, wait, hold on. We have this, this other picture. I'm sorry. I'm all messing you up. <laughs> this is a nice one. What is this one? Hey, Shamir. Yes. My computer is doing something weird. Give me one second. Oh, no problem. So this is another picture that um, that he was able to find in the Library of Congress's print and photographs. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, with the information that I gathered from the obituary, remember I learned that uh, City Point became, I mean, uh, City Point later became uh, Hopewell. So what I did was I put a search in our catalog for uh, Hopewell County. And I found this is the Appomattox Manor. This is the home of Richard Epps in like the 1860s during the Civil War. And that's one of the generals on the porch. So that's a, a, a picture of how the home would have looked uh, shortly after uh, Richard Epps, I mean, Richard Slaughter left the plantation. Wow. <laughs> I thought that was interesting just to get a, you know, a feel of what his, you know, his, 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 uh, where he was born, what it looked like, maybe the, the, the big house, maybe. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yeah, just to get <laughs> another image of uh, where he lived. Yeah, I like that because it's just, it just kind of allows you to take yourself out of today's mindset. Mm -hmm. And kind of step into that picture. Yes. Kind of put that person that we're looking at, imagine them in that picture. That's right, exactly. So you found another cool um, um, for step five, which was to search for additional records. You found mm -hmm. this other picture. Tell us about this one. Right. So, uh, of course, uh, I used Google and Flickr. Uh, Flickr is a, a, a database of uh, pictures. And I found that Appomattox Manor is now on the National Register of Historic Places. So you can still visit, uh, you can still visit uh, this location. And this is what it looks like now. Very nice. Yeah, so 
it's been uh, a restored image of uh, the location. Very cool. And that's just one thing that I found. I found some others, but I know we don't have a lot of time. So that was, so that's can, amazing. All the stuff that you were able to take a slave narrative and then you were able to kind of piece this together. Are there some things that you, um, because of our time frame, that you found that you would find interesting, or are there other questions that you have that you think that you might be able to find at your place of work? Well, uh, in in regards to Mr. Uh, Slaughter, I need to continue to search those plantation records because I want to find him on one of the records. Uh, I want to know more about his time on that. Uh, plantation. So yeah, that's one thing that I want to do. Yeah, to get more deeper into that. That makes sense. So let's mm -hmm. go ahead and do our um, quick start and all the steps review. So for locating the past at the Library of Congress, you want to choose a person. Mm -hmm. Then you want to research online records, learn about that person. Then you want to use clues from those records to search for additional records because every record leads to many records. Then step four is to locate the search the Library of Congress online records, followed by step five, which is to search for additional records. So did anyone have any questions? I heard some people say that the Library of Congress website is hard. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that, Shaman. Uh-huh. If I could. Sure. Uh -huh. It's hard for me too. <laughs> so you're not alone, but no, 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 seriously. Uh, uh, what happens at the Library of Congress is uh, with so much information, there's just so much information there and trying to manage all of this information can get really difficult. And they're always trying to uh, change things and update the website and they never ask the reference staff. <laughs> so, the, so we have to learn stuff over and over just like you. I'm going to say this about the Library of Congress. Basically, you have the Library of Congress and you have the National Archives, right? I kind of like put y'all together. And when it comes to websites, the Library of Congress has it going on. The National Archives drives me insane. And so if you guys want me to show you how to use the Library of Congress website, I will do something on that. I will do something on that myself because, I mean, don't be slamming my place. No, 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 I'm not buried. slamming it. No, I'm not <laughs> You're just saying it's not easy for anybody. It's not easy for anybody. I don't want them to feel alone. You got to okay. keep <laughs> but You know what? It's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Yes. I think it's set up beautifully. So if I can help people, <laughs> I will come up with some ways to help people. <laughs> so Ahmed, thank you for doing this quick start. We're going to bring back Jim and Michael. And how are you guys? How are you guys? Um, great information. Everyone is very excited. They said this is so wonderful. Um, they're very happy. Um, they said uh, they don't, Ahmed, they said they don't ask the patrons how to update the website either. <laughs> so I would just like to say, I don't have an end of question, but I, I'm going to throw out one. I didn't give you guys a chance to think about this, but because Ahmed is here, I just want to let him know this so he can help me out. Um, I have death on my mind. <laughs> a lot lately okay. um, because people in my family are just Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> so I always think about where are you going to be buried, right? I decided that I'm going to be cremated. Like it was a weird thing that for me to even feel that way when my aunt got cremated, we was like, what is the matter with her? But I get it. And I want to be cremated. And where the genealogy room used to be, 
I know I heard they moved and you guys are all the, at the Library of Congress, that room, that nice side room. And there was like this little area. It looked like people might take a little smoke break there, like right off the side, like right behind the vertical files. And so and you're mentioning between... cremation ashes and where they- Yes, I want to be sprinkled okay. right there. I want to be sprinkled <laughs> right there because if it's proximity of where you're going to be like able to, to float around, I want to be able to float around the Library of Congress. <laughs> so I may, so if that little area, I will get a picture. And, and so where do you guys want to be buried? I want to ask you guys that are on here to watching, <laughs> where do you want to be buried? Do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? I what is your be, final wish? Ahmed, where you, what's going to happen with you? I want to be cremated too, Shamel. That's interesting you say that. Do you know where you are you gonna do you want people to walk around with necklaces of you? No. Or do you want to be sprinkled in Michael? Where are you gonna be fair and buried somewhere. or cremated? Somewhere in the water, some some body of water. Okay, you mean I like that. Take me and Ahmed to the islands. Yes, throw me in the water. <laughs> Jim and Michael, I, buried or cremated. I well, I to me it's not mutually exclusive. Uh <laughs> I, I I don't mind if if uh I, I'm cremated, but I will, the cremains will be buried because uh, I have a lot already and okay. all it needs is a nice little tasteful obelisk on top of it. Oh. I, want, I want my tombstone to be an obelisk. So <laughs> it'll, it'll go well with my, uh, the, the rest of the people in the lot, my parents and uh, great, great grandparents and some great, great uncles and aunts. So you're going to be with your people. I want to be with my people, but maybe yep. they can sprinkle me out there. Michael, buried or cremated or both? Boy, I, I don't know. I would say if, because I, I have a burial spot too, but if I was going to be, if I, if I end up being cremated or decide that, I would want my ashes spread in, split and spread in three places. A little bit by my parents and a little bit of my two, grand, my sisters and grandparents are buried in separate locations. And that's where I would want my ashes spread in those three those three places. Fantastic. Terry Smith Harris says, just make sure that I'm really gone before the cremation process starts. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone have a fantastic day. Ahmed, do not drop. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.